Okay, let's get started. Hi, everybody. My name is Jennifer Cunningham. I'm the AVP for Alumni Relations here at Lehigh University. And I'm really pleased to be hosting this Mountain Talk today. Um, we have Rich Sherman. He's the class of 1989. And he's a full-time photographer um, who preserves the memory of military heroes who have never returned. Um, he's found a lot of meaning in this work, and I'm really thrilled he's here to um, share his story with us. Um, a little choreography before I hand it over to Rich. Um, first of all, we are recording, uh, so if you do have to drop off early, um, you can. we'll send you the link and you can come back and watch it or share it with friends. Um, if you have a question, um, Rich will talk for 5, 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll open it up to your questions and you can do that by hitting the chat button on the bottom of your screen here and type your question in or your comment. And I will read that aloud to Rich. And um, then we will um, conclude at one o'clock. So again, thank you all for coming. And Rich, I look forward to hearing your presentation. Take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Jennifer. If you give me a second, I'll switch over to the proper slide deck and we'll get started with... Never Home, Remembering the Military Heroes Who Never Returned. Hi everyone, I'm Richard Sherman. Uh, Jennifer, thanks for the wonderful introduction from the class of 1989. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a project I started about five and a half years ago to remember the men and women uh, who are interred in our overseas military cemeteries. The project uh, began around 2008 uh, when I jumped into a cab in Vancouver. It turned out that the cab driver was a Ukrainian veteran from World War II. And he proceeded to tell me amazing stories of the heroism and generosity of American troops that were fighting in Ukraine, uh, helping the Ukrainian soldiers, who were fighting the Nazis on one side and trying to survive the oppression of the Red Army on the other side. So since that time, well, a question has been in my mind and it just has never left. And that is, how do we thank someone that we've never met? Um, and that was a stimulus to start this project. As Jennifer mentioned, I'm a professional photographer uh, and have been uh, honored to have visited all the American World War I and World War II cemeteries. The idea of Never Home Heroes is not a history book. Uh, there are stories and personal histories in it, of course, but it is a book that honors the individuals who sacrificed everything and who, even in death, never made it home. And I primarily use the language of photography to tell their stories. As I was preparing for this, one of the things that uh, popped in my mind is we always talk about, oh, never forget, uh, never forget. And I think in an education institution, it's it's always interesting to think about how can someone never forget if we don't stop and teach them the, the stories in the first place. And so that, be, that continues to echo in my mind as we talk today. The American uh, heroes abroad, there are over 207,000 uh, individuals from World War I and World War II that are commemorated in our overseas military cemeteries. Um, to put that in context, that's a lot of folks. That's several times greater than every graduate uh, that would have graduated from Lehigh University and it's nearly 160 years of existence. Uh, that quantity would fill Stabler Arena more than 33 times. I think this image helps put in context the density of our losses. This is shot in the Florence American Cemetery in Italy. The project began in May 2018. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, uh, how do you thank someone you never forget? Well, you go and visit them and you bring your camera along and you bring people along with you. And that's what this project is. I won't go through all the trips, but suffice it to say, I've taken eight dedicated trips that have spanned three continents uh, in going and visiting our World War I and World War II heroes. The American Battle Monument Commission maintains these cemeteries throughout the world. Um, it was founded 100 years ago. The, if you go online, uh, Facebook sites or in, uh, social media sites, you see the ABMC is uh, celebrating their 100th year anniversary, and rightly so. It was um, uh, founded under uh, President Warren Harding, who uh, placed uh, General John Pershing uh, as the first chairman. Pershing, of course, led the American Expeditionary Force in World War I and uh, modernized uh, the American military almost single-handedly. 
There's a wonderful book about uh, General Pershing uh, by Andrew Carroll uh, named My Fellow Soldiers. Pershing was uh, dedicated to training his men and preparing them before putting them, men and women, before putting them in combat. Um, and it's right that he would be the first uh, chairman of the Memorial, Ameri the Memorial uh, Organization, the American Battle Monuments Commission. There are 26 cemeteries, 23 are World War I and World War II. Uh, there are 32 memorials, memorials uh, managed by the American Battle Monuments Commission uh, across 17 countries. Eight cemeteries from World War I, 14 from World War II. Um, Seren, just outside of Paris, just a short cab ride from the Eiffel Tower. If you're in Paris, it's a small cemetery, uh, but a beautiful location. Some 1,500 of our uh, uh, fellow uh, Americans lie in per per perpetual rest there. Um, Seren holds the remains of both uh, lost, uh, uh, both of our, our veterans uh, from World War I and World War II, including a set of brothers, and sadly enough, a set of twin sisters uh, who died, not only born on the same day, but died on the same day and are interred at Seren. You probably won't find it in too many guidebooks, but if you have a, an extra moment, I think you'll love going to see uh, the cemetery. It's a beautiful place and a wonderful um, location to memorialize our fellow heroes. Let's start with one of the cemeteries, Henri Chapelle in, in Belgium, uh, known for the Battle of the Bulge, uh, the last real offensive of the Nazi machine in late 1944 into early 1945. 38, an amazing 38 pairs of brothers are interred side by side. And in addition, there are as a group of three brothers, the Tester brothers, Robert Dent, as he was known, Tester, Glenn, uh, and James Earl Tester lie together uh, in the Henri Chapelle. Eliza Tester uh, had five sons that served in World War II. Uh, unfortunately, over the course of three consecutive years, she received telegrams from the U.S. Army uh, alerting her from her home in Tennessee that uh, her boys had passed. If that wasn't enough, just before uh, the first uh, son died, in 1942, her husband died of cancer and another son uh, died of 1942. These sacrifices were not just made by the men and women who deployed, but by their families as well. Dent on the top left, Robert was the oldest of the three. He died in 1943 uh, off the coast of Tunisia when his ship was sunk, uh, his body washed ashore in Algeria. He had lived in Illinois before the war and worked as a poultry farmer. Uh, and did a bit of woodworking as well on the side. Earl, or James, uh, on the bottom, he was uh, the youngest. Uh, he uh, died in 1944, uh, but survived landing at D-Day at Utah Beach, uh, but was then killed a few months later as the American forces uh, uh, penetrated the Siegfried Line and the approaches to Germany. Glenn uh, died in the Italian campaign in 1945. Uh, he was married, uh, married his childhood sweetheart, Marie, had a son, Frank, who he saw just once before deploying in 1944 to Italy. Frank, his sons uh, I've been in contact with, uh, shared some photos of his father who he never really knew and his mother, Marie, in the center. Um, this is images of Glenn Tester. Henri Chappelle is a beautiful resting place, uh, sad, but a beautiful resting place for these men and women uh, in Belgium. The most recent trip I took was uh, maybe a month and a half ago, to Manila American Cemetery. It holds the remains of men and women uh, that served throughout the course of the war from 1941 to 1945. A daunting 36,000-plus names are listed on the walls of the missing, uh, including the five Sullivan brothers, which you may have heard of. Um, the Sullivan brothers uh, were aboard the USS Juneau, uh, which was sunk um, off the, after the, or during the Battle of Guadalcanal. Uh, it went down in just 42 seconds. The five Sullivan brothers are listed just 10 months before the boat was sunk in January of 1942. Uh, one of their friends from home uh, had died at Pearl Harbor aboard the USS Arizona. And so George and Francis, who had served four years in the Navy before, uh, decided to join their brothers uh, and re-enlist. Uh, the one caveat being that they would serve together aboard the same ship with the, which I guess, unfortunately, the United States Navy honored. George was the oldest. He uh, survived the longest. Um, the others died in the sinking. He uh, survived for a few days at sea, but uh, witnesses says he jumped into the sea when he heard the news that all his brothers had perished. 
The Sullivans were a strong military family. Uh, their sister Genevieve even joined the Navy waves involved in recruiting. Um, and even after the loss of the five brothers, the parents, Tom and Aletta, continued to support uh, the Navy and the military and were involved in helping selling war bonds uh, to raise capital for the wars. Subsequently, two ships were named, uh, destroyers were named for the Sullivans uh, as the Navy honored their sacrifice. Uh, approximately 800 from the USS Indianapolis are listed on the walls of the missing. The Indianapolis is famous for having carried the enriched uranium and some of the other parts that ultimately went into the bomb of uh, uh, that, that was dropped in Hiroshima. Uh, I believe there is one survivor of Indianapolis uh, that is still alive today. Uh, Manila is a beautiful, a large cemetery uh, and has the most Medal of Honor recipients interred uh, with 29 Medal of Honor recipients. Here you see some pictures of the, uh, of the brothers. Um, in the top left, it's with uh, uh, Jack Dempsey uh, and some other photos uh, of the Sullivan boys. Luxembourg American Cemetery uh, is, is well known, also part of the Battle of the Bulge, of which Winston Churchill said, uh, this is undoubtedly the greatest American battle of the war and will, I believe, be regarded as an ever famous American victory. Uh, it inters the uh, many men and women, including General George Patton, made famous uh, through various books and movies, including George C. Scott's uh, infamous movie about uh, uh, General Patton. Uh, Patton was a leader from the front, a, a strong warrior, fought across North Africa and Sicily. He fought across France and rescued the, the lads at Easy Company, or most of them, which I'll talk about next during the Battle of the Bulge. Unfortunately, just a couple of months after the war had ended, he was involved in a, a, a car accident, uh, which broke, uh, his, it broke his neck and uh, then died in just before Christmas in 1945. Uh, and uh, at 60 years old, is right that he would be interred with his men and troops. See a map of the Battle of the Bulge, the last real offensive uh, as uh, a desperate uh, Adolf Hitler uh, tried to push back into the Ardennes forest. Uh, Easy Company, which is part of the 2nd Battalion, 101st Airborne Division, was noted for its physical training in Georgia and its courage under fire. I think many are familiar with Stephen Ambrose's book, Band of Brothers. There's been a, a video series as well under the daring Lieutenant Dick Winters. Um, these were incredible men. Um, they dropped, uh, of course, were part of the paratroopers at D-Day, uh, dropping behind Utah Beach. 139 men landed, only 74 survived. They got no rest. They continued to deploy in other battles. And then in the December of 1944, as I mentioned about the Battle of the Bulge and Hitler's last stand, they were tasked with holding Bastogne in Belgium, uh, badly outnumbered, uh, under-equipped. Um, they continued to fight. Uh, to the very end, and they were ultimately rescued by Patton, as I mentioned earlier. Not all of them survived, as we see here. Patrick Neal, Kenneth Webb, Johnny Julian, Skip Muck, and Alex Pancala uh, are in, laid to rest in Luxembourg American Cemetery. A famous quote from the battle, uh, the general in command of the 101st Airborne, Anthony McAuliffe, uh, was uh, was sent a notice that the Germans requested immediate surrender, to which he famously responds, nuts. Um, and there, uh, the, 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 the glory of Easy Company was cemented in history forever. These five men, along with 10 others, died in uh, January, the first two weeks of January of 1945, in the Battle of Bois-Jacques, the Jacques Wood, near the town of Foy, uh, just to the north of Bastogne um, in early 1945. There's a picture of Easy Company as part of the 101st. And lest you wonder what the conditions were like, in the winter during the Battle of the Bulge. I think these uh, images help to demonstrate what these men faced uh, day to day, let alone with a motivated enemy just a few meters away. Skip Muck uh, was one of the men, uh, got his name because of the kid he would skip everywhere. Uh, before the war, he had worked for Remington Rand Corporation. His first jump was at uh, D-Day at Utah Beach. Uh, he had taken cover in a foxhole with Alex Pancala, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, when a German shell landed directly on the foxhole and they were uh, unrecovered, um, again, January of 1945. Muck left behind his mother, uh, a younger sister, uh, Ruth, and an older brother named Elmer. He died exactly three weeks 
before his 23rd birthday. The Brittany American Cemetery is known for the uh, push uh, after the D-Day out to the west uh, as the uh, uh, Allied troops uh, cleared the area of Nazis and uh, enemy troops. Uh, Joe Little Squirrel was an easygoing young man, uh, Navajo, who loved to read. He enlisted in 1941 uh, in Oklahoma, uh, improved his medal, and was promoted to sergeant. Unfortunately, he passed away in combat at the Battle for Brest in Western France in August of 1944 at just 22 years of age. His family said he was very close to his father. It was difficult for him to leave uh, his father back home, and he would send money uh, regularly home for the care of his father. Native Americans are buried in several of the cemeteries, including uh, Tunisia, Rhone, and Florence, in addition to Brittany. Uh, Nicholas Cage's famous Wind Talker uh, movie uh, highlighted some of their courageous acts of the uh, Native Americans during the war. Joe's father was uh, offered the opportunity to bring uh, Joe's body home, uh, but according to the family, uh, a Navajo custom is to never dig up one uh, who has already been interred, and so Joe lays in eternal rest in Brittany in the western part of France. World War I and the Meuse-Argonne offensive, uh, the coming of age of the uh, modern American military, and certainly the birth of the modern Marine Corps. Um, included among the men are uh, William Solison from New Jersey. Uh, he rests in eternal glory under a, uh, a star of David. His family was generous enough to share a picture of the Medal of Honor, uh, which you see on the right here. Uh, he died uh, repeatedly dodging gunfire over and over to bring aid to uh, a wounded soldier uh, further up in the field. Uh, he was originally to be buried at Arlington National Cemetery, but once again, um, the, his mom, <laughs> in this case, uh, decided uh, to leave him with his mates uh, in Meuse Argonne. Uh, I, I don't know, it, it, I, it, just to even look at this as emotional for me, um, I'm an emotional person, but one of the most emotional events for me was att attending the luminaries uh, commemoration, uh, which happens each year at Meuse Argonne, uh, when candles are placed on the top each of the 14,246 headstones. It's the largest of our World War I cemeteries um, in, in the numbers of interred, and each and every name is read aloud on a, on a, um, a loudspeaker as, uh, as part of the commemoration. Normandy American Cemetery is probably the best known am among everyone. A million plus people visit it per year. Uh, there are 17,097 individuals uh, interred at Normandy, including uh, Teddy Roosevelt's son. Quentin Roosevelt was a World War I aviator uh, and died in combat in World War I. The average life expectancy of a World War I aviator, 21 days. Quentin was shot down. And when the Germans found that he was the son of the former president, they buried him with full military honors. Later, he was reinterred at Normandy when his brother, Teddy Roosevelt Jr., uh, had passed away. He was the most senior officer to land on D-Day as a brigadier general. And again, unfortunately, uh, just a few months later, uh, died of a heart condition and both men lay side by side at Normandy. I visited it a couple of times to Normandy. I had the distinct um, honor to photograph the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings in 2019. And uh, so that we don't think that these are all young scrapping lads, um, let's talk a little bit about Helen Fairchild, who is at the Somme American Cemetery. At just five feet, two inches and 122 pounds, uh, you can't pack more courage into a smaller package. She was one of seven children born to Ambrose and Ada Fairchild in Milton, Pennsylvania. She volunteered in the summer of 1917, a full year before the American Expeditionary Forces began combat operations. She left her home and went to Europe and volunteered to go to the front. Uh, she was exposed repeatedly to bombardment uh, and mustard gas. It is documented uh, on at least one occasion that she removed her own gas mask and placed it on the soldier that she was caring for. Her letters home show her, her courage. Um, she talks about uh, lamenting the re-wounding and killing of already wounded men. But she had a positive can-do personality. And I'll read a quote from her letter home. Gee, but it'll be glad to see you all by the time this war is over. But at the same time, I'm glad to be here to help take care of these poor British at the stage men. And I'll be doubly glad where our own US boys will be with us. 
amazing, amazing young woman. Uh, she uh, was among the first of the U.S. Army nurses to die in the Great War at just 33 years old. Again, she passed six months before, roughly six months before American combat operations formally commenced in 1918. There are dozens of other lives and, and stories documented in my book, Never Home Heroes, and we continue to expand. It seems like uh, it could be a project that lasts the rest of my life because uh, the stories all deserve to be told. And then there are the unknowns, 1,600 uh, graves from World War I and almost 6,000 from World War II in our 23 overseas military cemeteries from World War I and World War II. The walls of the missing are always difficult. Uh, 4,500, nearly 4,500 from World War I and almost 79,000 from World War II. Manila alone has 36,286 listed on the walls of the missing due to the nature of the combat operations, primarily Navy and Marines um, are, uh, are represented on the walls of the missing for the four years of combat in the Pacific. As you can see here, the Sullivan brothers are listed here. They're from Iowa, so you can just scroll down and see the, each of the, the lads from Iowa um, that are listed on the walls of the missing. The future of the project, well, all, all the photographs are taken of the cemeteries. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm expanding the biographical portion of the book. The, the target publication date is Veterans Day this year. Um, I'd ask if, you're, if you'd like to join me, please get involved. Go to neverhomeheroes.com. There's a little sign-up box that'll appear. Uh, you can uh, receive an update, which we do about twice a year. Uh, ask you to tell others about it, people that you know that may be interested. Uh, if you know of any other groups, like this wonderful opportunity to speak to the Lehigh community that would love to hear a presentation, uh, please just let me know um, and become part of the journey and, and, and join me in helping to never forget these amazing individuals. As Benjamin Franklin said, tell me and I forget, uh, teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn. So I often get the question, what keeps you going after five and a half years? And it's this one thing and this one thought alone is that they, these men and women deserve more than to be remembered as a statistic in a history book. There's Helen Fairchild at the Somme. There's Joe, Frank, Madison, Albert, and George Sullivan on the walls of missing in Manila. Teddy and Quentin Roosevelt in Normandy. Joe Little Squirrel out in the western part of France in Brittany, a Native American. Medal of Honor and New Jersey native William Solison at Meuse Argonne. Uh, the Tester brothers, Dent, Robert, uh, James, also known as Earl and Glenn Tester. And then the boys of uh, Easy Company, Skip Muck and Johnny Julian, Alex Pancala, Kenneth Webb, and Patrick Neal. These and hundreds of thousands of others were heroes who never came home. Those are my prepared remarks for today. I'd love to take questions, Jennifer, and oh. tell you more if you're interested about, about the project. Thank you. And um, we will send out uh, the links that you mentioned um, it, so that everybody has those after the webinar. Um, but it's striking how when you say their names, like I can feel it through the, you know, I know you're in Florida, but it feels like I can feel how you um, are emotionally connected to them and their families. So that's really powerful stuff. Um, we do have a few questions here. Um, Henry says, it is a shame that places like Ceresnes, Paris and Florence are rarely visited, although visitors are only 10 miles away. Are there any signs or any marketing that people would know if they're going? I think you said it was by the um, Eiffel Tower, like, or is, is it something someone has to seek out? Yeah, uh, I, I've never seen it in a in a guidebook. Not to say mm -hmm. that I read all the guidebooks, but uh, you can type in Seren into Google Maps, Seren American Cemetery, and the ABMC maintains a, an amazing website with lots of information about all the cemeteries, uh, brochures, history, uh, just incredible information. It's abmc.gov. It stands for the American Battle Monuments Commission, abmc.gov. Um, and you can, it'll even tell you how to get there. It'll tell you <laughs> the location, whether it's the GPS or where it's located. So that, that's an easy way to find it, or even Google Maps will take you there. Or I think it's uh, Bolt in, in Paris. Uh, you can jump in a, an Uber type uh, service and take you out there. It's just 
I don't know, maybe it's 20 minutes uh, from from uh, the Eiffel Tower um, and has an amazing view at sunset over uh, Paris with the Eiffel Tower sitting mm -hmm. right through the trees. Nice. Um, so Ilhan is um, Lehi's um, archivist. Um, so you might have a lot in common. Um, he's asking about your research. Um, how did you get all of that historical and genealogical genealogical information? Um, and then have you uncovered any stories related to Lehi or would you like to donate anything to the Lehi archives? Well, well certainly I would love to have a conversation about that. I've not uh, found a, a Lehi graduate uh, yet or Lehi, uh, someone who attended Lehi because let's face it, during the wars, uh, folks may may have not have completed their education, so I've not uh, uh, found that yet. It's a, it's a, I'm, I'm sure there are some. I, I just haven't found it yet, and I'd love to have a conversation about that. In terms of research, um, a lot a lot of this course is done online. The ABMC has been uh, instrumental. They've been very supportive of the project uh, as a professional photographer or professional videographer, who, who, whoever goes there as a professional needs to get permission. So they've been great in supporting me with that, and their archives are rich. Uh, the families have been instrumental in many of these images and telling their stories because I did, I I want to I want to hear who they were, not just what they did, right? I I, I appreciate their heroism, but I want to know what was what was he or she like, you know? Uh, what was their personality like? So families have been instrumental. Um, there's a National Archives, Library of Congress, uh, Letters Home. There's various books on Letters Home. Um, you know, just to try to to dig around everywhere to find to find stories and to understand a little bit more about these these um, two hundred seven thousand six hundred and twenty one uh, men and women who are memorialized overseas. Great, I'll put you in touch with Ilhan after the after the webinar. It would be my pleasure. Yeah, um, Ted says I think attendees would be interested in the work of the defense. Uh, the POW MIA accounting agency working to identify and bring home the unknown. How much have you worked with them? Uh, I have not. The, uh, the answer is I've not worked with them. You know, in terms of the POW MIA uh, uh, organizations, I've not worked with them. You know, the the POW MIA, while not exclusively, uh, its history dates back really to Korea and especially Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the uh, effort about World War One and World War Two. Um, there are there are there's the Army Quartermaster Organization, which has changed its name a number of times, is responsible for trying to uh, identify the the individuals that are lost or recovering uh, remains. Um, in fact, uh, in Manila, uh, several um, of the individuals had been um, bodies had been taken back home. It's a three or four year process to identify. Uh, the unknowns. Um, so in terms of, uh, uh, certainly the, it, one could believe that the POWs no longer are, are alive at this stage of the game. Um, and the, the missing in action, uh, I've not spoken with organizations other than the ABMC and their, doc, uh, their documentation. And a lot of it comes from the Army's quartermaster's uh, office about those who have been, um, have been lost uh, permanently or those who have been uh, recovered but never identified. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Mark is asking, he's curious if you've compared the names on the wall in the admissions um, alumni memorial building here to see the names, to the names you have identified to see how many Lehigh grads are buried overseas. He says, I was always surprised when visitors to the alumni memorial building discovered a relative on those walls. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I've not uh, taken a full accounting of that, but it's a wonderful suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Next time you're it's a wonderful uh, suggestion. You're up east, you can, yeah. um, or maybe we can take pictures of them and send them oh, to you. I'll come. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Let me know when you come yeah. to campus. I, I need I need a new sweatshirt. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, John actually says he has a name, Lieutenant Stanley E. Osborne, um, and then says, wonders if you're familiar with stories behind the stars. I'm, I'm writing down the name, uh, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Stanley Osborne. Um, I'm not familiar with story behind the stars, uh, and I'm not, I'm not exactly certain what that refers to, but I know there are gold star families. Um, I don't know if he's referring to uh, a specific organization, but if that's a name of organization, I'm, I'm not familiar with it. Okay. Um, so while people are um, writing some more questions here, um, 
Oh yeah, John says, yeah, it seems that your efforts would dovetail. So we'll send you that as well. Um, so um, what's next? Are you going deeper into this project? Do you have other projects in mind that you um, that you'll start as well? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. I, I think uh, I'm most excited about getting this project uh, uh, into publication, right? Mm -hmm. And I've been working with, uh, I would say, arguably the top photo book consultant in the business for the last, since I started the project, and she's been guiding me with this project. So getting this, you know, I mean, getting this in the hands of as many people as possible mm -hmm. is is what motivates me. And uh, so we're looking at all kinds of options. Uh, to get this out uh, uh, and get it as as broadly distributed as possible, so that's you know really what my focus is right now. I, it's it is very little time for anything else between, you know, I'm I'm doing I'm photographing at a conference this weekend between you know the the full time job of photography and and the book. This is taking up uh, all of the time that I have. I have other ideas about other projects in the future, but uh, those remain on uh, um, you know scratched down on a piece of paper. But uh, right now, it's just, uh, it, it's been a long journey. It's been five and a half years. We had COVID, of course, and that 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 made it uh, even longer. But uh, to be fair, I, I keep finding another story or another story. You know, I'd love to tell that story. So I just got to maintain discipline and and uh, get this thing, um, get this thing published. Uh, so that's, that's my entire focus right now. I do have other ideas, but priority one is getting this published and getting it into as many people's hands as possible. Yeah. And you mentioned in your bio that you um, that you sell a lot of photography to hospitals. Um, are you primary client? Are they pictures from your book, or are they pictures of other things? Oh, <laughs> sorry for for my reaction. Oh no, you can't you can't sell uh, uh, headstones to hospitals. Uh, uh, that that doesn't go over so well. So most of what I do is uh, I'm a big nautical photographer. I, I, I okay. photograph sailing races and boats and. Um, uh, landscapes and flowers. And, you know, as you might see in, in your local uh, hospital or health facility, in patient rooms or waiting rooms, images that are colorful and and, and calming is what I right, primarily right. sell. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, oh, let's see, we have a few more questions here. Um, oh, so John was um, um, expanding on the, uh, the stories behind the stars. He says, it's an organization's writing stories about all the servicemen killed in World War II and making them available through a phone app when visiting cemeteries. Great. That sounds pretty cool. That's a great, that's a, uh, thank you, John. That's all I can say is thank you. I, I will be certain to, uh, to download that app and jump on mm -hmm. the website if they have one. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's great. Uh, Marianne asks, are all of the cemeteries open to the public or is permission required for some of them? Hi, Marianne. Uh, yes, it, they're open to the public. There are uh, normal working hours, usually 8 or 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. or so, or 6 p.m. Um, they're open to the public. They are uh, part of uh, Americans. We own them. Uh, there, there, are, there are cemeteries. Uh, so they are open. If you do want to do a, a photograph, a photography project, then you need to request permission. But they're open um, and uh, happy to receive visitors. Uh, some of them are, are very sparsely visited, uh, as uh, I forget who, who had mentioned that earlier about Seren. Some don't, many times I'm the only one uh, there, but there's other places like, uh, for example, Netherlands is the second most visited and people came in and out throughout the day, but they're open to the public, uh, not just Americans. And uh, they're they're all in their own right, American places, amazing places from the architecture um to the emotion, to uh, the stories and the battles uh, that that uh, unfortunately brought the end to these great Americans, uh, they're 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 amazing places, and they are open to everyone. Hmm. Um, Ted says the DPAA is working and has been successful to identify fifty unknowns from the Huertgen Forest, also many from Korea, Tarawa. Guadalcanal, airmen from Europe, et cetera. The remains are then often returned to the U.S. for burial. For burial, almost every week, another one or several are identified. Yes, that, that, that's the former team. American quarter, the Army Quartermaster Organization. Yes, okay. absolutely. Uh, and you can follow them on social media as well. Oh. Uh, their work is time-consuming uh, and difficult, and I'm sure very emotional. But an, an amazing organization for certain. Yeah. And probably all done through DNA at this point, or still tooth uh, records, or 
uh, primarily DNA. Yes, mm -hmm. primarily DNA. Now the question is, do they have DNA to match it up against? But, and that's where it becomes family and, and stuff like that. But that's why one of the reasons it takes three to four years mm -hmm. to uh, properly identify someone. Yeah. Um, Henry says, I visited nearly as many as rich. I haven't made Brittany. Often wonder as I stroll through the cemeteries, when was the last time anyone visited this grave, if ever? Yet I'm overjoyed, especially in Margraten, to know that the Dutch have a waiting list to sponsor a grave. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I, 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 the Netherlands is, is uh, I think uh, many of the cemeteries, right? Yeah, I, you're surprised at the, the level of the passion that still lives today mm -hmm. among our European allies. The first cemetery I visited was the Psalm, and I went with my wife, who's a 91 graduate, Jennifer Heron. Uh, and that was a more uh, unforgettable trip. It, it was the first, the small cemetery, it's World War I cemetery. Uh, it was the first one I visited. Helen Fairchild's interred there. Um, and uh, we went on Memorial Day weekend. And mm. uh, people say, oh, you know, Parisians are difficult. Well, the Psalm's not in Paris. And one of the most amazing things was as I was photographing to watch the family streaming from the village of the little town up on the hill, all coming down dressed up as if they were, as if it was like a, a 1925, right? All dressed in suits and dresses and wow. hats uh, to participate in the ceremony. So uh, wow. our European allies, um, the experience was, was, was very real for them. And uh, many of them are do a wonderful job of wow. uh, of um, of uh, remembering the men and women that are interred in their in their country. Um, Walt is asking, do you happen to have relatives who were buried overseas in one of those in one of those cemeteries too? It, well, the answer is uh, luckily no. Uh, my my father was a Korean War veteran. My uncle, his brother, was a World War II veteran, um, and uh, my other uncle was a Vietnam veteran. And uh, thank God they they all made it home. Uh, but no, uh, uh, none of our family, uh, thank God, is 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 interred there. Um, this he also says the site of the Normandy Cemetery in person is humbling. I, I mean, it's 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 like kind of I don't want to use an overused term, but it's kind of a bucket list trip. I mean, no one goes away there without being wowed, right? You get to walk to the very cliffs. That were scaled and uh, just behind the cemetery and uh, the sheer number. In, in a quick story, in 2019, I went for the 75th uh, commemoration ceremony, um, and uh, the United States president uh, and the French president flew in on their helicopters, and mm -hmm. it was a big to do. I had a press pass. I stand next to people you you may see on TV from time to time, and there I am with my camera shooting away. Mm -hmm. um, but the daunting thing was, as I was, we had to go in several hours early at all our bags, of course, security screened, and it was, you know, an hour plus of a line for the media. Um, and then you get inside, and there's these tents that are lined up next to each other, and they all uh, face the, uh, the the headstones. And then beyond it was uh, the beaches, uh, Omaha Beach, Utah Beach, whatever. You, you get to see the ocean behind it. Uh, and they're just lined up, BBC, ABC, CNN, uh, French Five, whatever. All, all these all these are lined up. And they're, I don't know how many. I didn't, I, I, I don't remember, but there was maybe dozens of them. And the amazing thing is they set up with a platform. So they had their TV monitors up and they all were doing their broadcast. And this, they realized like, wow, they can all have this amazing large tent with this amazing view because there are so many of our men and, and women that are interred there. They all had the perfect view one mm. after the other because there are just rows and rows, mm. plots and plots of 17,000 plus uh, men and women that are interred there. That was that was a haunting realization as I was shooting. Mm. Wow. Um, Henry says, my grandfather survived World War II with a third ID and managed to stay out of the cemeteries. He says, I've done something similar as you have, turned out one of the most famous grads and fraternity brothers, um, not a Lehigh grad, but Cornell, um, Willard Strait. Oh, I know Willard Strait. Um, Henry, I'm a Cornellian, so I spent a lot of time in his building. <laughs> um, was buried at um, Sersnay's, sorry, I'm- Seren. Seren. Yeah. And we were there for the 100th anniversary of his passing. Um, and then Walt says, my uncles all survived World War II and my godfather was with Patton the whole way and he was in the infantry. Incredible that those people endured. Um, thank you for this project. It's very moving. 
Well, 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 thank you. Thank you for that comment. Yeah. Interestingly enough about, you know, Patton, what a tough son of a gun he was. He had never, not a single soldier uh, did he ever nominate for the Medal of Honor. Many of them have received the Medal of Honor subsequent to his death. So they were put up for the Medal of Honor by others, but he he just figured they were just doing their job. What a tough son of a gun. What a tough man. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we're right at one o'clock, but I do want to, there are several other comments here that we will um, send to you um, uh, as we are recording this. And um, yes, I mentioned at the beginning that we are recording. So if anybody um, would like to send this to a friend, um, you'll get the link in a few days. Um, I did want to end with um, Julie's comment. She says, I spent my sophomore year in Paris and I wish I'd known about Saran. I accompanied a friend to see the grave of his uncle who had enlisted with Canada before the US joined World War II and whose grave no one in their family had seen. At age 19, it was incredibly moving to be surrounded by so many graves of men similar in age to me. If I were to go now as a mother, it would be a different experience. So that's pretty powerful. Yeah. Um, all right. Well. Um, I also wanted to mention anyone on the call who is um, a veteran, please let us know. Um, the Steel Battalion is the ROTC outfit here at Lehigh. Um, it's sort of the headquarters for um, the about 11 or 12 schools in the area. And a um, senior um, who's about to become a young alum is very interested in um starting an alumni group or restarting. I guess we used to have a more active um, military group here at Lehigh for veterans and for those in the Steel Battalion, um, but that sort of fell off probably 15, 20 years ago. So we're trying to get that back up and running. We also do a Veterans Day uh, lunch here on campus and um, you know try to appreciate those who served our country, but our data is not very good. So if you can let, let us know um, if you serve, just let us know your name and we'll uh, make sure that we record that. Um, but Rich, I want to thank you. This was very moving. Um, fantastic. Obviously, the comments, uh, you know, you've you've touched a lot of people um, just today and we'll let everyone know um, about your book and send the links and all of that kind of stuff. And I'll hook thank you up with Ilhan as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I mean, at any time I, you get to tell a story to, to one person, let alone a, a large group like this, uh, just f I, I feel fulfilled. Just uh, it's just it's added, as I mentioned to you beforehand, Jennifer, it's added meaning to my life yeah. to go and visit these heroes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're clearly a great storyteller. And I'm sure with the photography, it's even more powerful than just the words. So thank you again. And thank you, everybody. Have a great week. Thank you.